Good morning and welcome to the Monday Call. I'm Stefan Clark, Chief Client Officer at NZ Funds. The world and therefore the market is a complex place to navigate at present. Higher rates with lingering concerns around inflation and geopolitical risks, counterbalanced by a resilient US economy and the attractive growth prospects brought about by AI, combined to make an interesting opportunity set for macro investors. This week, we're joined by James Gregor, partner of Syzygy Investment Advisory in London and NZ Fund's Monday Call interviewer turned interviewee. Syzygy is an alternative asset management and advisory firm focused on global macroeconomic thematic alpha generation with clients that include sovereign wealth funds, family offices, pensions, and NZ funds. It's great to have you here, James. I'm really excited about today's uh, conversation and very much in a different capacity this time. Thanks, Stefan, and hello to everyone. Yes, it is quite different. It's uh, in the hot seat now, not getting to ask the difficult questions, but hey, we'll do the best we can. Maybe I can turn around and ask you, you a couple of questions as well. And, and uh, hey, I'm, I'm that. leading the interview. <laughs> um, so you're now, ba you're now based out of London and you're working with Bill Callahan at Syzygy and, and of course, continuing to work with NZ Funds. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what your role entails and um, how you're finding arriving in another country. Sure. So it was, it's been an interesting transition, actually. Uh, for those of you that have moved countries, it's, it's a whole lot different. The last time I did it, which I was in my late twenties and had no kids to uh, now um, a couple of kids and, and moving the family across. And, and we, we started our trip obviously in New Zealand and went through the US to then arrive in the UK. And, and you do get a, I guess it's the nature of, of the job that, that we do is you do get a, a sort of a first-hand feel for how different economies are going and, and, and views, especially political views around around the world and what's going on. And so, yeah, I, and I'm sure we'll dig into both of those as we go, Stefan, but it's uh, it was certainly a, a interesting transition. What about Syzygy? What do we do? I, th I think if you think about the, the dynamics of the investment um, in the investment universe, and, and ways to invest. NZ Funds has always been that firm that wants to be curious and, and invest to reflect the investment environment, not just invest in asset classes because we always have. And that's essentially what Syzygy does too. So we try and seek out alpha ge generating opportunities, whether they be in commodities, interest rates, shares, bonds, whatever it is, uh, we, we research those opportunities, we get an understanding of the best way to have them represented in the portfolio. And then we advise clients like NZ Funds on on uh, on that position throughout its journey. So it's it's pretty much the same as what we were doing at NZ Funds, except in a, in a, in a different time zone, perhaps an easier time zone, because most of the stuff that we do invest in and, and the macro exposures in the NZ Funds portfolios are in UK and US time zone. So there's uh, no more 3 a.m. wake ups for a uh, CPI and GDP numbers, which is which is quite nice. Fantastic. So um, you mentioned traveling and um, take us through where you feel Europe and the UK are at, because obviously New Zealand is still in a recession, according to the data, and the US continues to grow. What What's the feeling over there? And feeling's a funny word, but I think it's probably the right word. I think with all that's going on in the investment world and political world, I think Europe is probably the and the UK are probably the jurisdictions that are under the most pressure, I think. And we'll talk about the US later, which is still uh, a, a resounding success in its economy, despite what's going on with interest rates and politics. But in Europe, they really are at the forefront of the slowdown and structural shift in growth in China. Um, if you think of the EU as a whole, they might be growing, albeit um, in small numbers, but big countries within the EU, like Germany, are already in effectively a recession. And that's because what they're, they're doing, I guess they're getting hit on, on both fronts. Uh, from a US perspective, Europe is importing their high interest rates. Really, when the Federal Reserve increases interest rates, most other countries have to follow. So in New Zealand, we've had an increase in interest rates. Yes, we've got high inflation, but really it's following the US and and the, a lot of the inflation in New Zealand is caused by US inflation, and that's the same as Europe. The other thing you've got in Europe, though, is their biggest export market, or one of their biggest export markets, is China. 
and China is massively slowing. So they've got a raise, rising interest rates. They've got a, a big trading partner that is slowing in its, in its growth prospects. And then the third uh, angle to why Europe's really suffering is, is from this high energy prices caused by not only the events in Ukraine, but the, what's going on in Ukraine is a big part of it. But a, a lot of their uh, energy, whether mainly natural gas, but oil as well, comes from Russia and their reliance on Russia and other countries that perhaps geopolitically aren't uh, flavor of the month at the moment for obvious reasons. And so those three things, higher interest rates, lower growth because of some of their big trading partners and high energy costs mean it's a, it's a real issue in, in Europe at the moment. And, and they are uh, bracing themselves for a, a certainly a slowing economy and, and much the same in the UK. Uh, the UK has the added bonus of, of a government that's not overly popular. And, and the problem with that, you know, whatever your stripes are, if you're, if you're in a government that's not popular, but you've still got quite a bit of time until the next election, it's just really hard to get reforms through. And, and so uh, you can't really make any major changes that really need to be done within the UK economy to get it out of its funk that it's in at the moment. Righto. And from an investment perspective, uh, that's reflected very much in prices, is my understanding. And so the you know in the European market, valuations are are exceptionally good, but you get what you pay for. I, I think, Stefan, that is an, that's an absolutely outstanding point. I think we have to be really careful with getting gloomy over economic outlooks uh, and and not let that tarnish too much. Obviously, it has a it has a fit an effect, but not let it tarnish too much our, our views on the share market. As I've always said and banged on about, and most of you are probably sick of me talking about it, markets are forward looking. If there's anything that you're reading in the newspaper, watching on TV, looking at in terms of data, it's already priced into the market. Um, and it's a very efficient market because of technology and data sources, et cetera. And so, all the aspects why Europe economy is under pressure is already, you could say, effectively priced into the market. Now, how long the pressure goes, so how long do inflation rates stay high in Europe and therefore higher interest rates, and how long does China stay low growth is, is probably some uh, aspects of that that you, know, you, you need to take a view on. But you're right, the, the European share market is really cheap. And, and something that provides an interesting opportunity. And I think when, when fund managers, especially active ones like, like NZ Funds and, and Syzygy, talk about this as a stock picker's market, uh, they're not just uh, plugging their own way and own strategy of investing, it, it certainly is. So Europe as a whole, the economy as a whole, yes, difficult, but there's some really cheap shares out there. And if you can buy the types of shares in the in the right industry in the right sector that do well in the current economic environment, you're doing that at a very cheap price, and you're going to do very well despite what's going on in the wider economy. And that's why being an active investor is so one important and two really exciting because at times like this, it just provides a huge amount of opportunity for uh, for investing. A lot of the commentary recently has been around inflation, and it seems to be driving um, markets as, as you know as a thematic more than obviously um, because it's been so elevated uh, than it has been for a very long time. And in June 22, we had U.S. inflation at 9.1 percent, and then I think a couple of days ago, uh, the most recent print was at 3.7, which was a little bit higher than what people were expecting. But core inflation was down at 4.2 uh, percent. What is your read on the direction of inflation in the US? And then what does that mean for share markets like the European share markets, Australia, New Zealand, so forth? So I think that's really where the entire market is, is focusing on, is uh, those inflation numbers. So really, if we, if we set up the construct for the rest of the year, that might give us a, a way to sort of approach and tackle that question. Because I think what what you're talking about is, is really important around how we think about investing in shares for the rest of the year and into next year. So the market in the US is currently pricing a no interest rate rise tomorrow or this week. Um, sorry, it's next week um, when the Fed, Fed meets on the um, 18th, 19th of September. So the, the expectations are there's no increase in interest rates then, but they are the market. So the um, 
the general market believe that there will be one more interest rate increase in the US before the end of the year, most likely November. And that's premised on the on those uh, inflation numbers that you've been talking about, and, and the fact that you know, we're still not down at their target rate. But if you actually dig down into the numbers, one, the, the, the strength of that inflation number we've just had, or a slightly higher, very slightly higher than expected, was probably caused by the fact that actually oil prices are, are stubbornly high and higher than they were just you know a couple of months ago. They're back at oil's back at ninety dollars a barrel, which is which is probably a, a place that we're likely to see it stay. Saudi Arabia, OPEC want it to be at about ninety dollars. That's their quote unquote break even price for oil. They want to do all these other things um, within their countries to diversify away from oil and to be able to um, afford all those infrastructure builds and. I think uh, Saudi were talking about turning um, Saudi into the Europe of the Middle East. It's going to cost a lot of money, and they they sort of forecast and analysts forecast that ninety dollar oil will get them there, and they can do that with you know, restricting supply. So that's one aspect why inflation was a bit higher, but it's unlikely that oil is going to go much above you know the the, the region that we saw it might go to during the Ukraine crisis. And so you're not going to get a, a, a second order effect of another spike up in oil prices or dramatic spike up at least. The second thing is inflation, a lot of it um, is is starting, that builds up the inflation number is starting to tail off. And a big part of that is, is the cost of uh, rent in the US. Now, th those numbers are, were a, a huge driver of inflation over the past few years, and that's really starting to come off now. And so rental is is starting to uh, come down significantly, and it's a significant, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but it is a significant determinant of the court of the inflation number. And and I think why, why it will take some time to come off, but there is reason to believe that it is coming off, is is because there is a lag effect you know when 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 um, things get tough you don't just ring up your tenants and go hey we're going to decrease your rent unfortunately uh, that doesn't happen um, what normally happens is you know there's turnover and, and it slowly reduces over time but there is data to su suggest that is happening one one aspect of that uh, number that you, you can look at is the equivalent of trade me property in the us called zillow and you're really seeing a decrease in rent across the board in the US from, from the Zillow number. So that's, you know, houses advertised for rent. And so, yes, it hasn't happened yet. People need to pay for that and, and actually take out a lease on these things that are, are for rent. But it looks like we're heading that direction. So if you've got an inflation number that slightly bit expectations just recently, but probably because of a, a higher than normal oil, a higher oil price, but not necessarily... Um, uh, going huge amounts higher and you've got other aspects of that inflation number really starting to come off uh, that puts less pressure on the need for interest rate hikes in fact and, and it, it is certainly our view at Syzygy that um, uh, we're unlikely to see that interest rate increase uh, at the by the end of the year and so in fact we we actually believe that there will be no more interest rate rises in the US this year. And I think that is a really important catalyst. Uh, it might not be, a, there might not be a cut in interest rates, but having that pause is the first step towards things just starting to calm down on the interest rate cycle. And, and really, when you go through to the end of the year with, with interest rates on hold, you're then going to start seeing some of that lag data come through, uh, whether it's, uh, GDP growth, whether it's slower consumer spending. Um, we just had a really high retail sales number in the US and, and that was really buoyant. But it appears a lot of that retail spend is being spent through the, the exhaustion of savings. So a lot of people during COVID saved a lot of money um, and, they're now, they, and they have and they're now spending it. And you can see that really starting to slow down now. And, and the reason you're seeing some of the data that you're seeing starting to slow in terms of retail and, and the fact that um, the fact that some of that savings has been exhausted is are things like travel. Travel, you're starting to see slow down. So these packed planes that you're seeing around the US is, is starting to lighten up a bit. And so all that, what does all that mean? 
it means that with interest rates pausing and more likely that the next move is down, that is a really, really positive environment for shares, especially shares that have already been um, really struggling over the you know year to date. Not all of them. There's it depends kind of the sector that you've been in, but on the whole, especially the shares that reflect the economy, less you know aside from things like Nvidia, um, you are, you're really seeing those companies at prices that are, are, are prices that you're happily pay for in an environment where share is uh, interest rates are going down. At the same time, it's really good for tech companies, high growth, low cash flow shares. Um, in an interest rate environment that is decreasing is really positive for those shares. So that's good for the US. What does it mean for those other markets? Well, as we said at the start, it's really the Fed that leads where interest rates go globally. Uh, it means Europe stops importing as much higher interest rates. They then feel less pressure to keep raising interest rates there. And there's also the domino effect down into New Zealand and Australia where um, there'll be other aspects why and we can talk about New Zealand in detail, Stefan, but there'll be other aspects why New Zealand probably is at the end of its interest rate hiking cycle. Um, but you're starting to see that pressure start to release, and that's really good for shares, especially shares that have already been um, struggling because it means they're at a better valuation than they were, you know, six to eight months ago. Yeah. Um... China's a really difficult one. I think there was an expectation, I, I certainly have it, had it um, at the start of the year, that China economy was under pressure and, um, and the government was going to do a, a huge amount of stimulus um, to get it back on track. And, and on top of that, shares were pretty cheap in China. They had a terrible 2022. So you had cheap prices and a, a weakening economy. And as we said, don't, um, markets are forward looking, so markets are priced in that weak economy. What they hadn't priced in yet was this big stimulus package that the Chinese government were going to come out and um, implement and, and shares were going to bounce from there. That hasn't happened. In fact, they are, um, they are being very, very, very long term and patient around structurally uh, stimulating the economy. Um, the housing market is a big aspect of that that is really causing a lot of grief within the Chinese market and, and Chinese banks. One statistic which is super interesting is if you think about um, China and and demand for housing and and uh, how much how much needs to be built that's already built that's uh, already been consented and, and all those stats that we talk about a bit in New Zealand. In China, there is the equivalent of 50 Manhattans. So it's 50, the island of Manhattan, New York, equivalent of square meters of, uh, of land that some of these prop, that one prop, that these property companies own that haven't been developed yet, but yet, um, but yet they, you know, they've bought and, and have ready to develop. And so that is the amount of land that is sitting there um, undeveloped but has loans sitting out on them um, that are now worth um, a lot less than they used to be. So there's a huge amount of undeveloped land in China um, and really there is no credit or, or um, way for these companies to get funding to, to build these properties. And so what you're seeing is properties that have already uh, and build projects that have already been started are being finished. So you are seeing, um, they're called housing finishes in China, uh, doing quite well, um, but there's no housing starts. This land that's sitting there undeveloped is not being is not being started. And that was a huge driver of the Chinese market and, and Chinese general economy. Uh, and, and, and so without those building starts and without the stimulus and the re remainder of the economy, you're starting to really struggle to get that growth coming through. And, and so the biggest aspect or um, 
I guess, stress on the Chinese market um, is perhaps not the share market, it's their currency. So the Chinese currency, the yuan, is pegged against the US dollar, and they're really fighting for their lives to keep that currency um, from depreciating too much um, against the US dollar. Because if that happens, the more you depreciate, uh, the, the more expensive things get um, in terms of trade. And, and that starts to become really difficult. It's obviously a little bit because then, you know, they export things as well, and that's good for their export partners. But China is really under pressure around the economy, the housing market, and then uh, pressure around the currency. And what does that mean for the rest of the world? Well, a slower China, a slower economy in China does put pressure on especially Europe, New Zealand, Australia. Um, the, and, and, and the problem with the Europe, Europe, New Zealand and Australia, we've still got high inflation. So we've got our biggest trading partner slowing in growth, but we've still got high inflation where interest rates might not be continuing to rise, but um, they're not being cut anytime soon, it, it appears, or not, not in, the, in the next few months. US is a bit different, though. It is putting pressure on US economy, absolutely. Um, but perhaps they're the least affected by what's going on in China and the economy still seems really robust. Okay. Um... It's interesting, right? Because the you know the success that drove China forward is a uh, an overarching question of whether that's ended or whether we're just going through a blip. And China's continue its uh, excuse the pun long march march to um you know building uh, uh, the prosperous nation that it's really trying to do. Do you do you see in, in you know growth picking up there, and then we'll be back to the you know five percent to seven percent growth? rate that we're used to in China? Or, or do you think this is the beginning of a, a, something longer term? Look, I think the the, the two aspects of views are, are exactly that, you know, do they put in huge amounts of stimulus into the economy and get that growth rate back up? Or are they happy with the new normal? And this is where I'm not going to at all profess to be a China expert. Um, it's really interesting, though, you know, you know, when um, if you're sitting there as um, President Xi and you want to stay in power essentially forever, you get you get um, dispose of your biggest critics. And so you saw that in the last um, conference where some of the sort of the older guard that uh, used to have quite a bit of power and say within the party were sort of removed. Not, not um, you know, not necessarily... Um, um, removed and in, in, um, in, a, in a bad way, but sort of put out to pasture and sort of forced to retire. And, you know, there was that famous um, um, clip in the um, in the conference last year where, you know, one of the, you know, old guards was sort of escorted out during the meeting. But the other thing that keeps you in power is the people have to be happy. And if the people are happy, then they're less likely to, to rebel and, and, and come against you when, when things are tough. And so, you know, on one hand, um, you could imagine that they will want to be stimulating the economy because if they stimulate the economy, then you get a, a, a stronger people and a stronger sense of, um, of uh, positivity and optimism, which, you know, enables you to continue to hold on to power. Um, the way that President Xi is doing it, though, it appears, and again, um, this is just sort of views from 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 reading rather than being a necessary an expert, is, uh, is to instead of stimulate the economy and get that going and pumping up back up to the six or seven percent that it used to be at. Given the economy is so much larger, to grow at six or seven percent is truly difficult. The focus is on security and, and that the sort of China first mentality. So what are the, some of the things that the government doing uh, to encourage that? There are things like uh, Taiwan and wanting Taiwan to be back part of, back part of China and, and that sort of show of might and show of power. The other one is around tech companies. And if you think about what's going on, what, what went on with things like Google and Facebook first, and, and that bought up companies like WeChat and, and Tencent on those sorts of companies. So they've equipped, they've got their equivalent fangs in China to and and they're proud of that and and they're amazing companies. Um, you know, Didi is another one versus Uber. And so it's to to create that infrastructure that the US has, but um, the equivalent the Chinese equivalents in China. 
But now they're going a step further and this, um, I guess, government ban on Apple devices and for any government employee, um, which there are 60 million of, is, is super interesting because one, you go, well, you know, it's only 60 million people and in China there's 1.2 billion, but we've got to remember the point that if you woke up tomorrow morning and, and the UK had just banned Apple, uh, that would be pretty big news and the Apple share price would probably suffer quite largely from it because it's not just the 60 million, I'm not suggesting that everybody has an iPhone, but let's say 60 million phones, it's also the, the watches, the laptops, the paying for apps, the services, and the UK has 60 million people. So so actually the, the banning of these devices by of, for government employees is, is big news. But where do they stop? And so, you know, what company is next if they're banning Apple as the next target Tesla? You know, Tesla is a big, China is a big market and, and China is a big market for Tesla. And uh, Tesla have quite a big uh, market share in, in China. And that is, you know, is that the next company to, to face some sort of ban? And then it goes from there. And so we might not see a trade war or per se. There's no banning of uh, phones, iPhones into China, but we might see a different targeted approach. And and I guess the natural reaction that the US may have is, is the other way around. And we saw it with Huawei, um, but we could see it with other devices. And so, yeah, you're starting to see a government that um, is perhaps knowledgeable enough to know that getting their growth back up to six or seven percent might not happen but how else do you make the people proud of um of 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 their leaders and and sort of still happy that they're in charge well it's putting the country first china first and, and that seems to be what what's going on and who knows how that plays out but it, it is alarming when i guess for new zealanders given given they're such a big trading partner yeah the the Taiwan story is tricky, right? I mean, who knows where that's going? Um, and obviously, there's a whole um, Taiwan being the world's largest semiconductor manufacturer has, you know, in addition to all the human elements to it, it has a huge economic um, risk attached to it. Which brings me to my next question, which is something that you've probably been thinking about during your travels a fair amount, which is AI, and particularly AI and what it means for investors. Um, we have, on the Monday call, we've had opposing views. Um, we've had AI um, from some uh, quarters as, um, uh, you know, the value is going to be realised very quickly from an investment perspective. And we're seeing that already as, you know, as people are, um, the, the, the recent run. And then on the other side, we've had from other people saying the um, benefits of AI will be felt by people, you know, um, users very quickly, but the investment benefits so you know building companies that are profitable and generating real cash flow from um, the services and tools that AI and efficiencies that AI can create um, uh, three five ten years even longer away how do you think about that this might seem cop out Stefan but I kind of think it's both and I, I kind of think it's both and I kind of think no one knows I think it's pretty brave to come and say look this is how it's going to happen you guys are paid you, to have a view, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> but if you think about um, if you think about what happened with the internet and then the tech boom and bust, and this is something that we've talked about before, is you know you have um, I, I think we did on one of the Monday calls we sort of said you know what a, have you ever heard of the company um, Pets for You? I think it was, and or, no, that's why was that one of the presentations that private wealth put on around the country and it was a show of hands who's who's heard of the co company pets for you and i think one person put up their hand but i think they just heard put up your hand and didn't hear the name of the company no one really has heard the, of the company pets for you unless you're in the market but it was one of the biggest companies on the nasdaq uh, just before the tech bust and they had no revenue no profit they had a domain name and an idea and it sounded pretty good and it, it got really big now i'm sort of making the story sound better than it was. I'm sure it was slightly better than that to be the best, biggest company on the NASDAQ, but we don't really have and haven't really heard of it since. But we've all heard of Amazon and Amazon is now one of the biggest companies in the world and has been really successful. Neither of them invented the internet, 
that both of them wouldn't have been able to do what they did without it. But you also have companies within the infrastructure of the internet um, who provide the service who have also got quite big. Microsoft is doing all right. They sort of they didn't invent the internet, but they were certainly, um, you know, with their Netscape um, and uh, sorry, with their Explorer, um, Internet Explorer um, um, apps and things like that. You know, have benefited very early on and very well from it. And then then there's the third and fourth order effects. Um, NZ Funds just released its uh, amazing digital wallet, which I've been um, really impressed with the functionality. And that's something that um, hopefully our clients, advisors, um, and NZ Funds, a firm, will benefit from to efficiently um, communicate and talk with and, and assess things with their clients. And so everybody benefits somewhere in the ecosystem. Um, and I think that's how AI is going to work. There'll be some quick winners early on, definitely. I mean, NVIDIA absolutely is is doing well because of the chip market. And that chip market is sort of, and I guess, is the first advanced wave of, of AI and, and, and those aspects. Not all AI, but a lot of it is AI driven. I think healthcare is a super interesting aspect with diagnosis. You know, um, if you can put all these stats and numbers into... Um, an AI software program that can then help you with diagnosis. I think that's going to be amazing, but that's probably like say three to five, <clears throat> three to five years out and there's trials and FDA approvals and all those sorts of things. And there's lots of stuff in between. So I, I think that in order to keep up with it, it's like any of these new technologies like cryptocurrencies, you just have to stay on top of it, have to stay curious and you have to uh, participate as you go not I'm going to wait and see how this pans out because if you wait and see how this pans out you've probably missed it on the other hand um, you don't want to jump at every um, everything that has the word AI in it because you don't want to invest in a pets for you and and so again you know the the technology is amazing how it's going to be monetized will be interesting um, but it's certainly um, something that is a positive um, can be a positive attribute to the share market and the dry growth of the share market going forward. Um, it's going to give a lot of. You're a lawyer, aren't you, Stefan? But, you I know. was former lawyer, reformed lawyer. Yeah, all lawyer. The, I mean, the winner of the, the winners of the day are going to be lawyers because there's going to be regulation galore when it comes to this sort of stuff. And so, but we have to work that all out. I don't think politicians even know what AI stands for yet. So, it's um, it's going to be a long, slow slog. Um, but I still remember, you know, remember when um, this is going to this is going to take us way back to sort of <laughs> our generation. But there's a Simpsons episode where uh, they were talking about the future and talking to each other through this computer where you could see someone's face as well as speak. And there was this ridiculous piece of technology that hadn't been invented yet. And wouldn't that be amazing? Well, you know, all of a sudden it came and. Zoom at one point was one of the biggest companies in the world. So it does happen. It does happen quite fast. And, you know, we'll have our, maybe we're just having our Simpsons moment now, but we'll, we'll move on to the technology. We'll start coming fast and, and, and almost without us recognizing that as, it is even AI, um, yeah. which, is, which is super interesting. The internet sort of crept up on everyone and suddenly it is part of, it's like plumbing of, um, of, the, of, well, of everything, of the way we communicate, the way we entertain ourselves, the way um, we do banking. Uh, and it just happened in little bits and bits and bits. But at the beginning, um, people didn't, you know, there was a lot of people thought it was a fad. Even, uh, even, yeah. cri even crypto was a bit like that. Like there's this talk that, you know, crypto just came alive and during COVID. Actually, it was 2010 or 2011 where Bitcoin was listed and started. And, you know, there was this whole ecosystem of, of cryptocurrencies and it took 10 years for it to really come into the mainstream these things take a while but um but you also would have made you know an outstanding return if you did invest in crypto for the first five years so just no one really knew about it yeah i i, I read just touching on your first mover advantage point um uh, i read a little thing last night about how google was actually the 16th search engine to be created so they definitely didn't have a first mover advantage when they started. Now it's obviously a mega behemoth, but um, 
they had they, they they saw what the technology was capable of and they found a way to do it better so you might have um you know all, all the ai companies today that are starting up and um it'll in the end um the the cream floats to the top and something will something we can't predict today will come through um all the noise it's just you need you can't beforehand identify which one it is yeah so no you've got to be no, there you got to be no one there. uses alta vista anymore and that was the one that was my one of choice <laughs> But, yeah, I, right. it's, but I don't even, like, AI is just this generic term for the technology, in my view. It's like the internet, and in in there's going to be so many uses. Um, one, one, I think, really super interesting aspect of it, and this is only because I listen to one podcast. You know, if I listen to another one, I'll get another really good anecdote. But it's just the ability to code and no longer, and this is no... Uh, disrespect to the quality or the um, genius that you need as a coder you know phds and and very intelligent people but the type of coding you can do on ai uh, means you just don't need um i guess apparently i could code using ai which is just phenomenal because i really don't have a brain to be able to code and i think those sorts of things are amazing because what does that mean for the workforce um, does it, does coding go, um, you know, do, you know, how does that whole industry change? Because if you think about Google, um, a lot of those companies, a, a big chunk of their workforce are incredibly, um, proficient at coding. And if you can do all that automatically, um, what happens and, and Google's not going to just up and, you know, fire half their team. They'll transition into something else. They'll transition into some other part of the business. But it's just interesting how the whole workforce will change because of AI. I think that's super interesting. And, um, and yeah, but how it happens, yeah, maybe it's for my kids to, to worry about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we actually had Michael Hansen from Fisher Investments on the call, who's an AI expert, and he spent quite a bit of time. For those of you who haven't listened, um, I encourage you to go back and listen to um, that particular podcast. We had some really fantastic insights. His view on this point on coding and the redundancy of coding as a sort of not not so much as a profession, it would shift and evolve to, I guess, like a you know, you used to have a, a shovel and you would do digging and now you control a digger. So the skill becomes instructing the machine rather than, you know, um, typing and or whatever, you know, all the, the, the thinking behind it. So the, the, a lot of the education that's required to be a coder is still, is still there. It's just you use it in a different way. Mm. Very good. Okay. You touched on crypto. Now, um, the crypto market's a really interesting one. There haven't been many new tokens over the last year or two, um, but at the same time, the institutionalization, um, it's a big word, of, of the digital asset world has continued. Um, and now there are ETFs being registered in the US. Um, previously, they weren't, and more and more banks are um, supporting digital wallet-type arrangements to hold crypto um, and also uh, financial instruments like futures and so forth. Where do you see that going? Um, obviously, regulation is part of this too. Yeah, I think regulation is really important. I think the the banks especially want to see a good, strong, stable regulatory environment for them to really get into offering services around cryptocurrency. As for not many tokens being um, issued recently, I think that's a function of the economic environment because that needs capital. And if you think as an individual, if you're an investor, um, even if you have $500 to invest um, and someone said, do you want to invest in a nice dividend yielding company that's going to be stable in a volatile environment like Contact Energy? Or do you want to invest in this brand new token that um, could make uh, uh, an enormous contribution to the cryptocurrency market and make a, a really good return, but it's going to be volatile um, in this kind of market, which one would you choose? And I think that's what investors are doing. And so the capital attractiveness, the capital being attracted to new issues is low. But that doesn't mean to say that the, um, the environment within the ecosystem of cryptocurrency is dead. Um, if anything, it's given the industry time to take a breather um, and to 
to work on things like regulation. And I think that um, they've actually been really stable. And these types of assets, um, as we've at NZ Funds, we have talked about for many years, uh, uh, act in two ways. The first way, which is Bitcoin, is a store of value. And um, it's, it's the type of asset that, you know, could do incredibly well, you know, when there's um, changes in interest rates. Um, and like we, you know, perhaps going through now. And so a decrease in interest rates uh, would be a very good environment for something like Bitcoin. And then a, a cryptocurrency like Ethereum, which is more sort of the, the technology based investment thesis um, is going to do um, equally as well because of interest rates decreasing, because that just means more capital will come into the market and um, there'll be more use cases. So Ethereum is like a platform with lots of different other companies will build upon um, and, and build technology upon, whether it's payments, whether it's um, giving unique identification numbers to pieces of music or fish in the sea or whatever it is, that's really where Ethereum's use case is. And so I think that the environment going forward is going to be really positive. It's going to continue to be volatile because it's a new asset class, but it, that's okay because it's only a generally for um, most um, investors, it's a small part of their portfolio. And and then regulation might have very, very short-term negative effects as, as new regulations are announced, but long-term makes it a really, really strong um, investment if there is regulation. And I'll give you a really good example and compare it to a really sort of boring asset. And that's something like Chorus. Chorus was going through big regulatory change in 2015. Um, and I know it started in 2015 because it's the year I got back to New Zealand. Um, and Chorus was all, you know, it's an uninvestable company because there's so much regulation. And, you know, the Commerce Commission is really going to intervene and not allow things to happen. But if you took a step back, go, hang on a second. That answer yes or no, are we going to use internet in New Zealand? Yes. Do we want really fast internet in New Zealand, given we're a small country in the middle of the South Pacific and we need fast internet to communicate with the outside world? Yes. Is fiber a good piece of technology that's proven? Yes. Well, it doesn't really matter what happens in the process to regulation. Once it's settled, it's the type of asset that you want to buy. And that's kind of how, and, and now Chorus at that time was trading at about a dollar and now it's at, I haven't looked at it, but it's around eight dollars maybe it's slightly lower because of markets but that's a pretty good return and and i sort of see the same sort of phenomenon in cryptocurrency albeit a bit more of a volatile journey and so i think um regulation overall is going to be a good thing might be short term volatile because of regulation but long term makes it much more investable so i think it's still there i think that it's and it, and with these interest rates you know potentially peaking it's also another short-term catalyst and i think that's why people are finding that the time is now to list these ETFs because uh, list them when, um, you know, when, when interest rates are where they are and as interest rates start decreasing, the market environment gets good. And, and if early investors in the ETF have a good sort of initial experience, that helps the ETF issuers and they, and they do well. No one's going to uh, uh, invest in a... Um, and the S&P 500 ETF at the start of a bear market. Um, well, that bear market's finished for crypto, it feels like in the short term at least. And so, you know, perhaps now's the time to start issuing these ETFs. So um, th that's the view, but it's it's crypto markets. They change every day. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's, but it does it's feel, I mean, if, if you step back, I mean, as a, you know, as a sort of asset pocket, it, it is a maturing market. And... 10 years ago, or even five years ago, people were saying it wouldn't be around in a few years' time. It's all just a bubble. And uh, and obviously, the, the other side to the equation was no, um, it has real value and it just needs to um, move along the um, move along the journey and become more part of the, the broader financial ecosystem. So it certainly feels like we're, we're further along on that journey. Yeah, I mean, it's still, despite having a tough sort of couple of months or so, it's still up. Just looking now, 56% year to date, 22% over the year, 300% over five years, and it's still up 10,000%. <laughs> so it's, um, 
it's now you know forget the, the that long-term performance a little bit because that's um but it is a interesting asset class and it's a diversifier i think that's the important thing when we talk about all these asset classes it's not because when you allocate capital as a as a investment um, manager it's not that you're sort of looking at one asset class and putting it all in there and hoping it does well and then turning around this is about trying to generate returns for all market environments and and you need some diversifiers in your portfolio we've always said that shares are going to be the biggest driver of compounding returns over time and it's going to form the biggest part of a portfolio at nz funds anyway it will always be the biggest part of your portfolio um, if you're a growth investor with a time horizon longer than five five years or so um, but there are aspects other aspects of the market um, and other asset classes that you want to invest in because that's not shares are not going to do um, that compounding returns day in day out and you want some diversifiers whether that's commodities or cryptocurrency um, or or diversification within the share portfolio whether ai stocks or the boring but stable contact energy so um i think that diversification is super important and it also keeps you up to speed with what's going on so the crypto market for example um having knowledge of that really helps with some of your share investing because you understand where the markets go absolutely and i think that point you make about um and we've talked about this many times on the call of course but that it is shares um, and in a growth portfolio, and obviously bonds, um, more so on an income portfolio, will always make up the core driver of your com of compounding returns. And then the other things are um, there to uh, as little pockets on the side where you can add value um, and and, um, and diversify away some of the risk, um, but they will never be the main component. Mm. Okay. Um, you're working for a macro fund now. What do you think when you sort of do some crystal ball gazing are the, the biggest geopolitical risks and that are on your on and Syzygy's minds that maybe aren't even aren't sort of on other people's minds? What are, what are you what, – what worries you? I thought we've just been crystal ball gazing for the last 47 minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, think, I think the um, – I think politics concerns me a little bit. Not, I'm, you know, I'm not. I'm not here to say left or right or red or blue or anything like that. But just more the um, the real partisan politics is does mean two things. One, it means that um, you get some extremist views, which means that you know that provides instability for markets. Um, but it also it also means that um, you you know you can't get much done at the core because we're so always talking about some of these extreme things and terrible things or great things or whatever your view is on the extreme things that are happening the th the the boring old things that lets you grind away sort of almost get left behind a bit um, and and a, and a good example perhaps of that um, maybe this is getting too too opinionated but you know in the election in new zealand at the moment um, um there's such a focus on certain aspects that um things like climate change was being forgotten about and um why do i worry about climate change i worry about it massively for my kids and and for the um i guess the future of the planet but also as an investment manager um you know it's for some of the companies that we invest in and, and where we see growth it's really affected by really extreme weather um good example is and maybe again a bit dear to my heart but things like ski fields you know um a little bit of a bumper season in mount rupehu but it looks like that you know it's not going to be a long season in new zealand and um the winter that they've just had in in france um there was no skiing for a lot of the french alps so things like that i think concern me a bit not climate change per se but sort of the how we can't get politics to sort of i guess a bit be a bit more agreeable around some of those aspects but then when i think about things specifically so what are some of the juicy comments i guess that that um that um that we have well when i think about um trump and some of the um i guess aspects of the market that and the volatility that um his presidency caused the first time round. well in actual fact i there is there is a lot of thought that he actually didn't truly think he would win the first time 
And so it did take two to three years for Trump and the team to sort of get their act together to start really implementing policy to reflect their views. Um, this time round, they've had the last year in power before they got um, voted out. And then the last three, four years of Biden's presidency to really think about what they would do the day they get into power if they get, if they win the election. And so um, it, it looks like it's going to be Trump versus Biden. I can't see how that will be um, any other candidates, um, even close to those two, which astounds me on both sides. But... <laughs> So we've got these two candidates, but if Trump were to get in, he's had much longer time, a lot longer time to plan out what he's going to do with his team. And I guess partly depending on where you sit on the political spectrum, <coughs> but for most, I think most New Zealanders, at least that is concerning. And it's concerning because I guess his biggest principle is becoming more insular as a country. And, and there are things that will have big effects on, on trading partners, but also big effects on big aspects of global politics, which are happening at the moment. So the first thing that I think would be really worrying is pulling the US support out of Ukraine. Uh, the second biggest worry is pulling US support out of Taiwan. And those two aspects, um, especially Taiwan when, when it comes to New Zealanders, is, is a, of real concern about what are the, what are the um, ramifications of that and, and what do other people, other people meaning other countries, do like Japan and South Korea if, if that were to happen with Taiwan. So I think that is a, a, a real concern. And on the other side, I guess if Biden comes in and I, I, and I don't have any evidence of, of what's going on other than to say that um, you know, there has been concerns around lapses in memory and cohesion and things. And, and what happens if, if um, you know, Biden isn't the president for the entirety of his four year term if he wins the next election? And what does that do to the sort of uh, power of the US and, and the imbalance of power? And do other um, interested or disinterested parties like Russia and China take advantage of that? So that's the geopolitical aspects. In New Zealand, I think, um, if I come back to sort of more my domain, which is the investment markets, I think uh, New Zealand, and it's quite good in some ways being a little bit distant for the past couple of months because you, you reflect on it perhaps with a bit less personal anecdote, is really this housing market needs to stabilise. And uh, that housing market stabilising and then the consumer getting used to, on, on the most part, um, much higher interest rates and um and uh, combined with inflation needs to to really come down because those people that are paying high interest rates on their mortgages and those people that are paying much higher costs of living expenses means the economy will slow um and that and that you know does it tough for um especially the more vulnerable parts of the country and i, and I think that um just creates more um social um uh I guess volatility, which which is which is always you know hard hard to to comprehend when people are struggling out there. So I think those are the the biggest worries. And what does it do for financial markets? It just creates instability, and with instability creates markets that are not confident. Companies are less likely to want to invest and spend capex, and and that means the economy you know does chug 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 along truck along. Um, a little bit chug along, <laughs> chug along, yeah. A little bit, a little bit slower than usual, and so I guess I guess those are those are the main concerns. But again, looking from afar, looking at New Zealand and looking at where the fight is in politics, um, I guess the positive aspect, given I'm sitting in a country, the UK at the moment, which <laughs> politics are just absolute crackers in terms of um, what's going on. You know, they've had five prime ministers and you know, and 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 not and not too many years, and uh, that's almost worse in Australia, I think, which which had a pretty bad reputation. Um, yes, there's a lot of arguments and disagreements between the two main political parties in New Zealand, but they're pretty close, really, in the scheme of things. And maybe that's a construct of MMP. Maybe MMP 
that Jim Bolger put in place as a referendum by accident all the way back then actually has created a more stable political environment. And, and so that, that can only be a good thing, um, even if Winston Peters gets back in. Yeah. Well, I mean, one way to look at it is, you know, that's the role of um, an investment manager when, when you're thinking about portfolios, uh, is one to position assets in a way that are really well structured for the current environment and to identify as an active manager. So if you think about NZ Funds as New Zealand share exposures, their theory, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago with Mark Brooks um, and Casey Kuiper, on, uh, uh, who are in parts of our investment team, uh, the, the setup is for strong cash flow generating um, businesses with, um, you know, you know, big client bases who are able to pass on costs, your contact energies, your meridians, your choruses, um, your Ryman health cares, your sparks, your telstras. So they they are really well placed to um, weather any kind of political turmoil for the short term. And, um, and obviously over the long run, they um, are there to generate compounding returns. So as that, um, as the, you know, any instability that comes through the sort of the political process flows through you know as an active manager we're very careful about where um you know the the funds are positioned but over the long run you know elections don't really make a big difference do they especially when you have a red and a blue party that are so similar i, I think that's absolutely right and look we can wax lyrical around politics for the next three hours and, and it's interesting don't get me wrong i, I love politics I like reading about it I like talking about it but from an investment management point of view you just have to forget about it because yeah. Yes, there's going to be some pol politics and policies that are going to affect share prices and bond prices in the very short term. But in the long term, the way that NZ funds researches companies is do these companies have inherent value now and are they going to be worth more in the future? And no matter what the politics are, things like a retirement village is going to be that is trading at below book value is going to be worth a lot more in 10 years time than it is now. Companies like Chorus, and like you say, Telstra, um, Meridian Energy, who has big hydro power stations, they are all going to have inherent values that are going to get, increase over time. And that's really exciting. And it, it, the, the, the environment is, is, is almost irrelevant. And like I said, you know, there's going to be Sky City Casino, which isn't in the portfolios because of ESG, but that's a good example of a very short term headwind um, because of regulatory change. And actually, it's not the type of business you want to be in because it might not exist in five years' time. There is a real possibility that things like casinos are outlawed in some way in New Zealand or Australia. And maybe it doesn't happen, but there's a possibility. I don't think there's any possibility whatsoever that a hydroelectric power station is outlawed in New Zealand and provides nothing but, but um, uh, you know, a great um, form of clean green energy for, for New Zealand households for years to come and that's kind of how that's in the blood of an NZ funds analyst that's what I learned all the way back in 2001 or something or 2000 when I started um, that's what Casey who's been there for a couple of years has been taught um, that's what Mark's been doing for 30 years and and and, and it's kind of um, in the in the blood of, uh, of an analyst and and what politics means for it is, is, is kind of irrelevant albeit like we say, you know, it's interesting and it's and it's fun and um, and listening to the debates is um, rather them than us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who knows why you get into it? Okay, <laughs> hey James, I'm conscious it's late where you are. Thank you so much for your time. Um, it's really neat to um, speak with you and uh, see that you're all set up in London, and um, we'll we'll no doubt be in touch in the near future. Sounds great, Steph. I'm looking forward to doing this all again soon. Great. Thanks, see you later. everyone. Have a great week. This has been the Monday Call, brought to you by NZ Funds. New Zealand Funds Management Limited is the issuer of the NZ Funds KiwiSaver Scheme, the NZ Funds Managed Superannuation Service, the NZ Funds Advised Portfolio Service, the NZ Funds Wealth Builder, and NZ Funds Income Generator. A product disclosure statement for each is available at nzfunds.co.nz. Past performance is not necessarily an indicator of future returns.